And then should I wait for a few minutes to kick off? Okay. Hi everyone, I will leave it one more minute to let others join and then we will kick off. Okay, I think we'll start now. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for joining the session today. Um, this is the IGC webinar focusing on uh, information sessions for research funding. And this session is specifically designed to cover policy engagement and co-generation. Um, I'm Ella Spencer, I'm the Director of Impact and Learning at the IGC. Um, we will kick off today by having a kind of broad presentation, which will cover a few different areas linked to the topic of this session. So we're going to start by kind of explaining how we think about policy impact and engagement from the IGC side, including how we think about it from an ME perspective. Um, we're then going to talk through some of the drivers of impact, so the things that we've seen have been successful at the project level in kind of driving policy engagement and impact. And uh, we're then going to talk through kind of our the concept of co-generation um, and some examples of engagement that we've seen in our program. We'll then open up to a Q&A and we have um, three of our current um, and former country economists on the call who are going to answer a series of questions. And thanks to everyone um, in the session who sent those questions in advance. We've kind of compiled them and thought about the different themes they cover. So we'll cover a few different areas there from things you've sent in. And if we have time, we'll cover any kind of additional um, uh, Q&A that you might want to send through today. Um, but it was quite tight timing wise, so we'll see how we go. Uh, so I will start by handing over on the presentation side to Rob, uh, Annam and Twibway. Thanks, Ella. Um, hi, everyone. Hopefully you can all see uh, the slide deck on your screens. Um, I, my name is Rob, I'm the male manager at the IGC, and as Alice, uh, Ella said, I'm just going to run through fairly, fairly quickly um, the key things about how the IGC um, approaches policy, um, policy impact, uh, and then how we look at it from a monitoring, evaluation, and learning perspective. So I think the first, the first key thing um, to note is that IGC's core mission is to support data-driven policymaking via robust, relevant research. Um, we commission a variety of types of research, of, of activity um, across uh, quite a few different themes, but everything that we do is geared towards um, driving uh, data-driven um, policymaking. So, of course, policy relevance um, of all proposed research is therefore assessed in detail um, and does factor heavily on whether a proposal is successful or not. Um, the relevance is assessed first and foremost by IGC country teams. I'll talk a little bit about the makeup of the country team in the next slide. Um, but uh, for, for the purpose of this, um, just to say that these teams are made up of in-country policy uh, and research experts, and they're very well placed to assess the policy relevance of um, uh, research proposals. So um, when, we, when we look at proposals, there are certain criteria that we, that we want to understand that help us make a decision about whether you know a research proposal has thought through its policy engagement um, uh, well. So the first is the extent to which 
uh, the project is demand led, demand informed or supply driven. So if we think about that as, as, as a spectrum, um, we are interested in, in, in knowing, you know, to what extent has a project already uh, had policymaker um, or policy stakeholder influence in informing that, that proposal, or to what extent um, has the proposal assessed the policy context and thought through um, specifically how, how that research might target um, a specific policy need or whether it's supply driven, for example. Um, feeding off of that, the extent to which and ways that policy stakeholders might have already fed into, into project design. This is by no means a prerequisite, but uh, it is something that we would look at and that, and that does factor in, into, um, into the decision making process around commissioning. Um, whether relevant policy stakeholders have been clearly identified. So if they haven't fed in um, at, at project inception, has the has the research team thought through you know effectively and realistically who who the research is to engage um and then feeding off of that how how the research plans to engage those people you know is there an effective dissemination plan in place um are there are there realistic commitments to to um policy maker or stakeholder engagement throughout the project whether it's uh, at an interim stage or at project end so how the IGC can support and does support policy engagement. Um, first and foremost, again, to mention the resident country teams. So these are typically made up of a country director, uh, lead academics who have expertise in, in research themes within that specific country context, and then resident country economists who, who manage um, the broader project portfolio on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think it's fair to say that the IGC's in-country uh, resident team network sets it apart from, from most other players um, doing similar things. Um, it, it helps by um, enabling us to build and foster long-term relationships with, with policy stakeholders. Um, and then that in turn helps support things like um, identifying um, what proposals are most likely to get policy traction. So by having a, a clear view of, of what the policy priorities are at any one, one point in time, um, how, how policy uh, research proposals can be um, developed to make sure that they are relevant and they're likely to get um, a policy audience and, and traction subsequently. Um, facilitating access to data. So by leveraging those existing relationships, uh, country teams um, play a big role often in facilitating access to important data sets, which um, without, um, without those relationships, without IGC being a trusted partner, can be very difficult to gain access to. I think increasingly um, we're seeing uh, the value of, of um, high quality administrative data sets in, in facilitating research, and that's something that the IGC um, can and does facilitate. Um, stakeholder engagement. Um, so um country teams can really help uh research teams connect to the right people at the right time whether that's at the proposal stage or as projects are being implemented to to share research um to make sure that the sort of the key gate gatekeepers um, and decision makers are, are uh, the, the audience of that research um and then linked to that planning and supporting dissemination so um country teams are, are really helpful at supporting teams through identifying what the best kind of forums uh, for engagement might be um, and how to convene the relevant um, decision makers um, throughout a project. Um, I think I'm doing okay for time. This is my last slide. So reporting on policy influence, I think it is important to say that, um, that we do report on, on uh, a project's sort of policy outcome as, as a key measure of a project's success. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a component that um, is embedded within our, our log frame, and so we, we, do, we do dedicate resource to it. Um, the, the monitoring and evaluation learning team that I manage, we have dedicated forms um, that, that, um, that every single project that's commissioned um, are, are required to provide. So at the, at the beginning of a project, a, a policy influence plan, which outlines how, how, how the project intends to influence policy. And then at the end of a project completion, a policy influence report, which, which asks for information on what engagement has happened um, uh, and then what this means in terms of policy outcomes. Um, we, I think policy can be uh, quite formally seen as you know, a, a formal policy document. Um, 
that has gone gone through gone through um, the government and and it kind of sits there and it's and it's a really formal thing. Yes, of course, we see those as as key outcomes um, alongside things like changes and reversals to existing policy. But also we take a broader a broader approach to understanding policy outcomes. So influencing longer term strategies, for example, um, changes to process or, or operations that lead to better decision making, you know, building data sets, tools and processes that, that support decision making on a day to day basis. Um, and then also informing the design and development of, of new products. Um, uh, you know, for example, if it's a private sector, um, if it's a bank, you know, a more inclusive, flexible loan, for example, product um, or, or an operational approach. Um, so yeah, we take quite a broad understanding of, of what a policy uh, sort of policy influence looks like. And then with that, we don't just see governmental sort of policymakers um, as as important, but also um, equally, you know, private sector. Um, decision making as uh, decision makers as well as as well as those in civil society organizations as well. Um, and then I think finally just just to say um, that alongside um, you know having ongoing in-depth conversations with our country teams to understand the, the types of um, policy outcomes that we're having in country as well as the formal um, documents that, that we that we get from from projects. We also want to validate our, our claims to policy impact by collecting a range of evidence from various stakeholders. So we work with research teams, we work with our, our um, economists in country to build a really strong picture of uh, the policy outcomes and impact that, that projects have um, through a range of evidence, whether it's policy documents or stakeholder um, accounts um, and, and correspondence. Um, I think that's uh, a whistle stop from me. If there are any questions on, on specifics of those three slides at the end, I'm happy to take those, but otherwise I'll hand over to Anam to talk about sort of drivers of policy impact. Thanks, Rob. Um, so my name is Anam Anis and I work as a research coordinator at the IGC. Um, Rob, if you can just change this slide. Thanks. So uh, I'm just going to talk very briefly about what we think drives impact for IGC projects. Um, the most important driver, as Rob has mentioned before, is building a good relationship um, and building good engagements, uh, specifically with the country team. So we've, we've done a review of our projects from the past few years, uh, and we have seen that project approval rates are much higher for projects that have been discussed with the country teams before submission, as you can see on the left graph uh, here. Um, on the right graph, you can see um, that the projects that have been discussed with the country teams achieve much higher impact as well, as you can see from the uh, orange uh, bar graphs here. Um, we've also seen that policy uh, country teams have also access to policymakers, and we can facilitate introductions. Um, they can facilitate introductions for the research team. So we would strongly encourage you to get in touch with the uh, with the relevant country team uh, before you submit your proposal. Um, in terms of engagement, we've also seen projects achieve better policy impact if they have embedded research, research staff and just more generally when the researchers are more mission driven. Um, the idea is to build a relationship with the government stakeholders, um, which is which could be a long term engagement because we've seen that long term engagement tends to be more successful uh, for, for such projects. Um, next slide, please, Rob. So when we're talking about relationships and engagement, um, I also want to mention briefly the role of the non-government organizations. Uh, so this kind of engagement can be really beneficial for the cases where issues are political and can be influenced uh, through think tanks, uh, media outlets, um, et cetera. Um, secondly, talking about the collaboration and co-generation. Um, my colleague Twibbe will talk more about this in the later slides, uh, but we've seen that projects that have been co-generated have better buy-in from the policy counterparts and it increases uh, the policy relevance of the research. Um, the second point that you have here um, has come up in our previous webinars as well. So the idea is to generate the research question together with a policymaker. It is very important to uh, iterate on the key policy questions to come up with the research question that has policy relevance, um, and that will help drive good impact for the project. Uh, we've also seen that integrating technical counterparts from the government um, in the research design and implementation can really help achieve high policy impact. Um, 
the second thing that we, uh, the third thing that we have here is the policy relevant interim outputs. So it is important to look at what the government actually want and need and produce interim outputs, keeping that in mind. So we've seen in the past that descriptive data often can be very interesting and useful for the policymakers. And so descriptive outputs uh, that might be provided to stakeholders um, to provide engagement uh, and that just helps with the wider research process. Uh, the next point is on the different types of dissemination. So it generally helps to have different kinds of dissemination for different kinds of audience. So a mixture of closed door events with um, large events can be very beneficial. Uh, what it does is that it helps um, allow for better engagement. You're able to um, identify follow-ups and see where findings might be interesting to other stakeholders. Uh, the last point that we have here is on innovative research. So we've seen that testing new policy interventions can have high policy relevance. Um, uh, as an example, at IGC, 70% of the top five economics journals are associated with policy decisions. So um, next slide, please, Rob. So um, I also want to talk briefly about what generally drives low impact in the project. Uh, it's worth keeping this in mind when you're designing your project so you know how you can work on these, uh, these issues. So the first thing we have is the lack of counterpart. So this happens when policymaker needs are, for example, not taken into account in the, at the proposal stage or at the very early stage, and the research is not very well targeted. Uh, that can result in really low impact for the whole project. Uh, the second thing we have is the appropriateness of outputs. So this is for projects with low impact. Um, generally, projects with low impact have poor quality outputs and they have lack of policy relevance. And so the result is that they're not beneficial for the intended audience and you won't see very good impact from those projects uh, or from those outputs specifically. Uh, the third thing we have is from um, uninteresting results. So sometimes findings are not very interesting. They do not show anything new. Intervention is not successful. And for example, is the decision to not uh, to proceed with the scale up of the project. Um, the, the fourth, fourth thing is uh, on data constraints. So this happened when researchers are unable to collect good data and don't have access to good quality data. And as Rob mentioned before, the country teams can be very beneficial here because they uh, might be able to help you um, access a good quality data. Uh, and the last thing uh, is the changes in the political context. So this happens when, for example, a key stakeholder, for example, moves position um, or the political economy um, is such that it's very difficult to make a policy change um, at that time. Um, and that's why it's encouraged that you have a good kind of stakeholder engagement um, with the with the with the policymakers and also with non-governmental um, organizations, uh, so you can influence policy in different ways. Um, that's it for me, and I'm going to pass on to Twipe now. Um, thanks, Anam. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide, Rob. While Rob is doing that, I'll just briefly introduce myself. My name is Twipe Siwale. I'm currently a policy economist at the IGC of uh, London Hub, but I'm also previously a country economist and I spent a number of years working in Zambia. So yeah, I just want to, be, uh, to kick us off with just discussing what it means when IGC talks about its co-generation approach. I know it's, it's IGC speak, we say this a lot. And uh, this infographic sort of gives us um, um, a great representation of what we mean. So when we're not talking about co-generation. Um, we the way we view research is as a as a very collaborative thing, and we view um, the research process as involving primarily three uh, three aspects or three teams. Uh, we think we we when we're thinking of co-generation, we're thinking of including policymakers in the in the in research processes. We view research um, policymakers not only as decision makers and implementers of, of policies, but as knowledge creators. So we view them as integral to the process of, um, of, 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 of research design, the execution of the research, and eventually the implementation of it. The other piece of the puzzle, I think, has already been spoken about, which is the country teams and the, the knowledge that they have. And then the other piece are researchers or PIs, and I'm sure many of you probably fall into this category. And uh, our researchers sort of bring the academic rigor, they bring the research designs, they understand where the frontier of knowledge is. And with the input from these three teams, um, they all collaborate, generate ideas, generate policy advice, and then it creates a virtuous cycle where that advice is 
fed back to policymakers and the process starts again. And this, this is where aspects of long-term relationships and long-term engagements um, tend to come in. Yeah, I think you can go to the next slide, Rob. Yeah, so I think Adam has already told, uh, talked about the drivers of, uh, of policy impact. Uh, I just want to sort of get uh, a little bit more into the details of the uh, how high impact models uh, relate to how um, researchers engage. So I have loosely defined these into four different models. And these are things that I've seen in country as being, uh, as enjoying different degrees of success. So um, the different ways that uh, we find projects begin or researchers engage is um, firstly, you find that some projects are policymaker led. So a policymaker has a question, it might be a per perennial problem, it might be something that is specific, they want to launch a policy and they're a very specific question. And as a researcher, it's possible to create or design a project around that. It might not necessarily be the very specific thing that the policymaker is asking, but it is possible to provide input and to evolve that into a researchable project that would then uh, be perhaps eligible for funding under the IGC program. The second model is a data-led model where researchers have perhaps interesting data sets, maybe they've combined different types of data and they've come up with um, a data set that could be useful to government. Uh, the other is uh, government itself is a great generator of data, a lot of admin data. I think Rob mentioned this. And uh, a researcher comes in and helps government to organize that data and then builds a project around that, which is, um, which is also usually very useful because if government is a generator of that data, then it, 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 they become not only uh, users of the data, they are producers of the data, but they become users of the data and uh, it again in improves processes. The third is the RA-driven model. And um, I think uh, Anam also mentioned this. This is when researchers decide to embed a research assistant into a government ministry or agency. And that uh, research assistant is on the ground, is able to engage, is able to respond in real time to, to requests, and also to just understand the environment better. We find that those types of engagements tend to be very uh, successful. The last one is the researcher-led model where um, a researcher goes out there and builds relationships with policymakers and creates those links and then uses those relationships to drive whatever research agenda that they may have. Uh, Rob, go to the next slide. Yeah, and I just wanted to give you a very quick example before I, I, I finish off, which is uh, a project that I'm personally uh, helped to initiate and I'm currently involved in. Which, is, uh, which has to do with fiscal electronic devices and VAT revenue in Zambia. Uh, so the way this project started was that the government was rolling out this policy intervention. Uh, they required that all VAT registered businesses should use EFDs. So our research team went to them and asked them, could we evaluate this policy? Uh, how do you know it's working? How do you know if it's, it's not making things worse. And the government said, oh, okay, fine. If, if that's what it is, then we can um, agree to work with you to evaluate the, uh, the, the, um, the program and see how effective it is. Uh, so we came with a practical solution to something that they were already doing. And what we did is we used, inter firstly, we used international experiences from other countries, other IGC countries as well. And uh, we used that to inform uh, the government on on, 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 on to give them useful information about uh, electronic physical devices. But then we also use the data because um, electronic physical devices generate a ton of data. And so we use that data to give insights into, uh, into policy processes. And then beyond that, we are now proposing uh, how they can um, come up with complementary policies and to experimentally create evidence uh, using now very rigorous research designs to determine how different uh, complementary policies could perhaps make electronic physical devices more effective. And um, this is a project that is over time. So it started as a small project and now uh, as you keep going, it, it, it keeps generating more work, more interesting insights and um, just speaks to the idea of, uh, of co-generation. The next slide, please. And this should be my last one. And just um, finally, just to give you a few ideas about um, also finding handles, even as you are sort of designing your project or policy, what I'm calling policy impact handles. So I think some of the things which we found to be effective was working with um, perhaps with a ministry that has convening power, such as a Ministry of National Development Planning, 
uh, ministries that have access to ver various other ministry and agencies and are able to perhaps tell a ministry that, oh, they are working with you and they need data. And that tends to have um, give you more access. Uh, another idea is to build feed evidence into established policy processes. So if you know that there's a budget coming up and a certain agency is particularly uh, keen on feeding into a budget, you can time your findings or work things around such that you can feed into that process. Uh, the third is to look for windows of opportunity. So um, there, it, when you're working on a project, sometimes there'll be something that will happen, a change in personnel, a change in policy that we can take advantage of and use that to, to, to feed into, into policy processes. Lastly, I think it's to find a, a policy champion in a specific ministry, identify those people who are interested in research, they're dynamic, they want to learn, and um, they also have sufficient influence to be able to, to drive a policy change should it happen. So I think I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Twifwe. Um, and thanks to, to Rob and Anam too for the timekeeping. Very good. Um, so yeah, now, Rob, if you could go to the next slide, actually. Um, Twifwe has already introduced herself. Uh, she's on our kind of panel now. I wondered if I could just ask Priya and then Henry to introduce themselves briefly as well. Sure, thanks, Ella. Uh, so my name is Priya. I'm uh, just recently completed country economist with the IGC Uganda program. Thanks, Priya and Henry. Over to you. Oh, I think we maybe have lost Henry. Um, okay. Okay, Twee, Priya will continue with the both of you for now, and then hopefully Henry will rejoin. He is a country economist in our Ghana program. Um, so hopefully he'll be back with us soon. So thanks very much everyone for the questions and all the questions in the Q&A now. I think everyone's trying to kind of answer those as, as they go. Um, please do put your questions in the Q&A chat rather than in the chat function. Um, and I think uh, you can also see there are lots of people asking the same question about whether you can submit proposals um, where the IGC doesn't have a resident team uh, and the response to, to those questions are all in there as well. Um, and thanks to everyone who submitted questions in advance. We've tried to kind of group those by theme. And I think lots of that should have been covered by the presentation, particularly in terms of what does policy impact look like and mean for the IGC. So we're gonna focus now um, the questions on research design and policy impact and IGC involvement in policy engagement and ensuring policy recommendations are effective. So that's kind of consolidated from everyone's questions that were pre-submitted. So I guess on the, on the first one, thinking about research design and policy impact, and then I'll, I'll pass over to, to Priya and Twigwe to give their thoughts on this. Um, lots of people asking about how they can kind of maximize policy impact by thinking about it right from the start of the project. And specifically, how can they work with policymakers to think about re both research design and the research questions being answered? Some of those kind of interactions and then a very specific question around um, research methodologies. Are there specific research methodologies that you would think are kind of particularly helpful for policy engagement? So um, Priya, I'll come to you first and then and then over to you, Wei. Sure, thanks, Ella. Um, so, so I think, I mean, yeah, as you said, a lot of the answer to the first question has been covered in the presentations. Maybe I'll just echo a few of those points. Um, I think first and foremost, the most important thing in terms of maximizing the likelihood of policy impact is engaging with policymakers from the very beginning of a project. So that can either mean that a project is a direct request from a policymaker, or at least that um, the, the project or the initial idea is discussed with a policymaker from, from the very beginning, so that there's, as, as was mentioned, a kind of iterative process where the research design can be adapted in such a way that it's most useful for policymakers whilst also of interest to the research team. I think uh, the, the points about finding a, a champion who's interested in the area that the, the research will inform is really critical. One of the questions that came in uh, in advance of the webinar was about, you know, the challenge of finding policymakers who may be reluctant to take on board uh, the implications of some, some research. And I think that's really trying to find those reform-minded policymakers who are looking to diagnose the gaps in policymaking and try to improve policy implementation is critical. And that's 
definitely something that the IGC can, can help with. Um, I think in terms of, um, there's no kind of clear blueprint as to, to what makes a, a good path for policy impact, but I, I, I guess the, um, in addition to what I've also already mentioned, I think, I think uh, the points about, you know, sharing interim outputs, pro having some space for descriptive work that could, that could um, be useful to, the, to government even before the final research outputs is really critical, both in keeping uh, the government partners that we work with interested in projects, but then also increasing the impact from, from one project. And then the final thing I'd say is that I think um, from, from a country team perspective, some of the greatest impact is really about research teams following up after, a, after a, let's say a paper is published to see what the next steps are for policy, what the next avenues are for research. So building up these longer term relationships with government partners can actually lead to further impact and further research. So that's, uh, that's maybe, okay, and one, sorry, one, one last thing I'll say is that I think from a country team perspective, when we're thinking about evaluating proposals on their policy impact, I would add that in, in addition to, to a, pol a project being policy relevant, it's kind of critical that the policymakers or the agency or authority that the findings will be relevant for has the capacity and the mandate and the resources to really um, implement a change if, if, if you know, the research suggests such. And I think to Evoy's point about you know, have, working with the policymakers who have convening power is part of that. Thanks. Thanks, Priya. I think we might come back to that implementation question in a little bit as well. Um, Twibwe, did you want to add anything on any of that? Um, I think just one quick point on, there's a question about uh, particular research methodologies that support this. Um, I think uh, on the co-generation piece, this is where the researchers uh, come in. I think uh, one thing that we, we've seen is that successful projects have appropriate and strong research designs. So if you have a, a research design that's not very clear and, you res, uh, and it results in project findings that are not also very clear, it, it, it's, it becomes difficult to engage with the policymaker with, with that type of output. So I think when it comes to research methodologies, it's, um, it's really great when it comes from the, uh, from the academics or the, res the, the research design is, is pretty strong. I wouldn't say there's a specific research uh, methodology that I'll say, okay, this one works. It's, it, it, it's all context specific. There are some great projects which work with um, admin data. There are others which work well with RCTs and uh, we rely on the researcher to sort of uh, chisel that out. Yeah. Great, thanks, Trevor. And I was going to add to that because I think Christian just posted in the in the chat um, asking about the kind of range of methodologies that the IGC will consider. Um, so just to emphasise Twibway's point that we will consider all methodologies, and the robustness is critical. But that doesn't mean that we won't look at a range. It, there's not one methodology that we prioritise. Um, Henry, thanks. I think you've joined, so I'll get you to introduce yourself. But I wondered if you could also comment explicitly on. Um, kind of research design with policy counterparts. I know that you have a number of projects in Ghana where, where you're involved in kind of the end-to-end -end research design process. So I wondered if you could talk a bit about that from your perspective too. Hi everyone, my name is Henry Telly. I'm country economist for Ghana and I'm based at the University of Ghana at Lego. So, in well, terms Henry, of um, design, maybe, sorry, I we're think, losing you a little bit. I wonder if you try, maybe go without camera, sadly. <laughs> but yeah, if you could, yeah, just so we can make sure we can hear you. Okay, is it better? Okay, so yes, so um, in terms of design, really, I think the, the, the first point which has already been made is that it's always good to start by talking to the country team. The country teams are able to, you know, um, work with you. And if you don't already have links with the specific policymakers, then they are able to create or help you start that relationship. And you would get, you would then get the the, the policy uh, input uh, as to the specific questions that they are interested in or the specific aspect of the topic that I would like to work with you on. So the, that 
that process helps to sort of establish that relationship that promotes the code generation that the IGC model uh, is based on. And that is, uh, you know, the, the first thing. In terms of methodologies, I think it's also already been mentioned that we don't really focus on any specific methodology. We are interested in having any, any methodology that answers well. And the question should be policy relevant and also interesting or contributing to the academic debate. So, so that's the way we, we sort of look at it from a design, from a design perspective. Great, thanks very much, Henry. Um, so I will move on now to just kind of IGC involvement more broadly and then policy recommendations as well. So I think as has been mentioned a few times in the chat um, that we will fund proposals not in countries that we, in countries where we don't have resident teams, but we do then expect those proposals to have very clear and strong policy engagement. Um, so, but I think for those of you on the call who are interested in working um, with, uh, with countries where we do have resident teams, then the points that, that everyone's kind of made about engaging with them in advance is uh, definitely really important. Um, I wonder, uh, a question, I guess, for the panel really around kind of the most effective um, forms of policy engagement from your all of your perspectives and kind of past work with, with the IGC. Kind of what do those forums look like? How do they change throughout the project? Um, and I guess also what do they look like at the end of the project when you're thinking about how to target and tailor findings um, in the most appropriate way for different stakeholders? Um, so uh, Twibri, maybe I'll come to you first. Um, thanks, Ella. Yeah, I think I'll just give one which I've seen to be very effective and I've used in my in my work, which is sort of, I, I, I tend to begin with um, a literature review of international experiences uh, that I give to the to the policymaker or a presentation bringing together international experiences on that on that specific issue. This is even before I think of submitting a proposal to the IGC. So I use that to generate a demand and to uh, spark interest and to show our comparability with com our comparator countries. Because I've come to understand that policymakers um, want to be made comfortable in terms of what you're proposing. It's not some out there idea. It's something that they know that countries similar to them are, are, are potentially working on. So start very light touch. Once that has been engaged, um, I, I look for someone who I can work with and there's usually, I'll usually be assigned to someone and you try and get that person to have uh, the appropriate buy-in. Then the next stage would be to, pre uh, to prepare some sort of an interim output, which might combine use of data from, uh, from, from, a specific, from, from the agency itself uh, together with, uh, with, with, uh, with, with insights. And then at that point, I'll probably submit a proposal to the IGC uh, detailing that I, I'm already engaging, we've already reached this point and would like to now take things a step further. And at that point, I would also identify the areas where I'm going to feed that into uh, or, or where I project or I have ideas about what is, how it's going to change things. So yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Great, thanks Twibwe. Um, Priya. Uh, sure, yeah, so I guess just, I think Twivo's covered most of the really important points. I'll just add two more. Maybe one is just that I think it's really useful once you've established, once you have a, a conversation or a dialogue going with, with the relevant policy counterparts, I think it's really useful at, at an early stage to draft some sort of concept note that then can be uh, iterated back and forth between with the government partner, because I think it's really helpful to put pen to paper, be very clear on what each partner is expecting out of the research project. And it, it, to me, it, it helps a lot in, in then when, when you finally are able to turn that concept note into a proposal for funding, you know that this is something that you've already got buy-in from your government uh, partner and, and you know that it's not something that's gonna, uh, yeah, it's gonna have some sort of buy-in in that way. One other thing I would say in terms of ways in which we've built up I mean, I'm not sure if this is exactly answering the question, but I think it's what worth what warrants discussion is just that um, in in I think all of our country teams, we also have events with um, our our counterparts in uh, which can either be 
kind of forward looking in terms of governments, um, government partners highlighting key themes that they're interested in. And then we would either commission research or, or undertake liter literature reviews as Twivoy says to inform some of those questions. Um, or it can be events that disseminate research uh, across a number of different research projects in a theme. And I think these events are very helpful in identifying new areas of research, but also um, and, and kind of creating a impetus for, for co-generated research. Um, yeah. Great, thanks, thanks, Priya. Um, Henry, I wondered if you wanted to expand. I know, I know the Ghana team um, hosts a kind of range of different forums and events uh, as well to kind of think about how to support researchers at the kind of end point of a, of a project. I wondered if you wanted to expand on that too. Yes, I would. But even just to add, you know, one more point to the, the point that Vivi and Priya have raised is, you know, one, one other thing we find that really works is following the policy issues very closely. And once, you know, you hear government talking about a particular issue or sometimes they're just even talking about a problem or a solution they have, then you go to them. You know, at that point, usually they are very receptive because it's something that they are thinking about, it's something that they are working on. And so when you go as a researcher or, you know, somebody who is just interested in supporting them with research, they normally would really welcome you and will tell you that, okay, this is the, you know, this is what we want to do, or this is what we are thinking about. And these are probably the areas that we are not sure of. These are the questions that we still have or this is what we don't understand, or this is just what we want to do. Um, how do we do that? What is the best way to do that? And so that also you know, gives you ideas on how to now generate your, your research um, and, and put it in the broader literature for the academic purpose as well. And that also means that you, you are doing something that they are interested in and they would always open their doors for you and they would be willing to work with you at that point. And you know, normally at that point, they are even willing to facilitate it, it, you know, either collection of data or providing data that you would need to help them with the analysis. But apart from that, we also, um, from time to time, do these, uh, what we call stakeholder consultation meetings, events, where we bring um, government stakeholders and other stakeholders together and have discussions with them um, about what we think the issues are. And, you know, we, we do this as part of the process we go through for developing our country strategy. And our country strategy is basically a document that highlights some of the areas that we think policymakers are interested in locally. And so as we go through that development, we, we establish a lot of relationships and try to pick the specific issues that policymakers would be interested in. So when um, researchers look at our country strategy, they may, they may find areas that align with their own research interest. They can come back to us, the country team. We would then go back to the, the stakeholders who are working in those areas and try to either link them or, you know, start that relationship, um, um, you know, get that relationship started. When, you know, before COVID, it was also easy to travel. So we would have, sometimes we'd have scoping visits where the researcher comes, we introduce them to the policymakers and they have a chat, they, they talk about, you know, the interest the, the researcher may have or the, the you know, the specific interests that the policymaker may have, and then they find, you know, where they align and where they can work together and they start projects. Projects have started, very, very interesting projects have started that way as well. Thanks very much, Henry. I think we've gone a little over, but I'm just going to try and wrap up with a, with a couple of questions and, and also to highlight that for um, countries where we do have resident teams, there are kind of summaries of the country strategy notes that Henry referenced online. And that's a really useful way to kind of get a sense of where some of the policy priorities are for country teams. So definitely worth looking at those if, you, if you're interested in research in one of our partner countries. Um, so the final point, and I think, I think Priya kind of referred to this earlier, it was around 
there was a really interesting question around kind of policy implementation. So this isn't an area that the IGC explicitly um, focuses on, uh, but it is something we obviously think about a lot in terms of the policy impact side of things. So yeah, um, uh, I don't know if there's if someone kind of specifically wants to come in on this, but there was a question about kind of strategic ways of improving, I guess, the likelihood of policy implementation with research, um, which Priya briefly addressed earlier. But I think Henry might want to come in. He has the unmuted. Yeah, I think I think that itself is a research question <laughs> um, because uh, the, the the what we were learning is that the, the policy making policy implementation you know processes is is is, is complex. Uh, it's, it's not that linear. So you know they might have policy and they might have a policy implementation plan. So you know, it, 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 part of it depends on how well the policy implementation plan is able to capture the spirit or the, the main point in the policy itself. And then, you know, from the plan, there's the actual implementation, which can also, you know, be very different from even the plan itself. And so at every stage, so we start with a problem or a, a vision the policy may be designed to sort of tackle that problem or to reach that goal. And then there's a policy implementation plan um, that is also developed. And then from the plan, they, you know, they actually try to implement the policy and then they measure the impact uh, where possible. So in any of those stages, you know, something could go wrong. And for researchers, we, and, and, and it provides opportunity for us to actually then work in, in all the various stages. Coming up with the, with the, the policy decision itself, um, developing the implementation plan, you know, and then also the implementation. Usually when we are working very closely with policymakers, we get to, you know, at least take part in some of these stages where you know we are working with them on a project to sort of maybe fine-tune a particular policy then we we discover something we share with them that they because of that discovery maybe sometimes even by the before before the the the, the research is actually done they might actually make some change at some point so the the, the implementation becomes an evolving process where you know they are learning because they're working with researchers, you know, the data is being collected and they're learning to actually improve the implementation as they go along. But there, there isn't, you know, one strategy that works across board. Thanks, Henry. And actually, I will just answer um, Enoch um, Blind's question from the chat link to this as well. I think you were asking about which stage of policy impact the IGC is more interested in, short, medium, and long. Um, I would definitely say all of those, and I guess that links to, to kind of Henry's points here around um, the longer term policy implementation and the fact that we really do try and follow that through where possible. Um, so yeah, all sides of that. And uh, definitely from the kind of monitoring and evaluation side, but also obviously from the country team side, those are things we look to track uh, following up from research over a longer period of time as well. Okay, um, great, thanks so much. We've run, run over a bit, so I will end the, the webinar there, but thanks um, to all the panelists and presenters uh, for joining today. I think hopefully some really useful content for everyone that's joined, and please do feel free as well to follow up with us with any more questions. Thanks everyone. <laughs>